and welcome. I'm Kirk Christensen, President of the American Planning Association. Thanks for joining me today for a conversation about the road to recovery and the essential role of planners in restoring our economy and rebuilding our communities. I think that there's no more critical issue for the planning community right now than answering the question, how do we lead the way to a resilient, equitable, and sustainable recovery? This conversation is part of APA's work to answer that question. Congress is working now on legislation to provide more support for state and local governments and considering options for infrastructure investment as a tool for stimulus. Planning is essential to recovery. We need to make sure it's included. I'm delighted to be jo joined by John Pacari, President of Advisory Services for WSP and former Deputy Secretary of, of U.S. Department of Transportation. John was also an APA's keynote speaker at NPC 20 at Home. Today, we're going to pick up on some of those issues and themes, stimulus, recovery, and transformational planning. You can ask, access this, uh, uh, that session and the full NPC 20 at Home collection via planning.org backslash NPC 20 collection. Welcome, John. Thanks, Kurt. Good to be here. So your session was uh, very well attended on that, that final day, uh, and thank you for being part of that uh, session. Uh, the NPC 20 at Home was extremely successful, and we thought this would be a good opportunity for us to continue that conversation. So in the NPC 20 at Home session, you talked about the work happening in Washington, D.C. on Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, asking, Kurt. It's it's a really interesting time. As you know, there's been some uh, temporary short-term relief uh, for the uh, industry in the form of $25 billion for transit and $7.4 billion for aviation and a, a roughly a billion dollars for Amtrak. That's just for the operating, uh, uh, short-term operating holes that they have and, and only part of it. As recently as earlier today, the House uh, uh, announced a proposal uh, with $15 billion for highways uh, and uh, a little over $15 billion for transit. Um, and uh, it's the starting point for the next uh, negotiation. And as you pointed out, it's, it's really crucial uh, that planning be part of this discussion from the beginning because this is not just about uh, triage about stopping the bleeding on the um, operating costs for infrastructure systems. It's actually about building a better future and a different future. And you can only do that uh, through a more holistic uh, process that includes planning. Yes, uh, I would completely agree with you. And I think that we've had a, a lack of, of infrastructure planning, uh, especially since the Great Recession, which kind of leads me into the next question. Uh, the last time we did an infrastructure uh, did infrastructure in a stimulus bill was the, the American uh, Recovery and Investment Act during the Great Recession, uh, what, about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and you were Deputy uh, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation then. What lessons should we take away from the successes and limitations of that le legislation? It's a great question. Uh, uh, first, uh, the Recovery Act, from an economic development and economic recovery point of view, did what it was supposed to do. The, uh, the infrastructure part of that nearly $800 billion bill was $47 billion uh, for infrastructure. The infrastructure part of it uh, went off very well. There were projects uh, that were underway very quickly. Um, I actually had a unique perspective. I started as a state, I was a state DOT secretary putting together a program uh, when the stimulus bill was signed. Uh, we had the first project underway the day after the president signed it. And a few weeks later, I, as you point out, I was deputy secretary administering the program at the federal level. Um, so it, it worked in getting people get back to work. Uh, its big limitation was it was not transform, transformational in any way. It wasn't intended to be. Uh, we have a different set of circumstances uh, today uh, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, and we certainly know a lot more uh, about the, the built environment. And uh, if you think about uh, background issues uh, that have to be front and center uh, going forward, like climate change, the, the non-transformational nature of the last uh, stimulus bill uh, 
needs to be supplanted by something that that really thinks uh, more widely about what kind of future we want. At the end of the day, these investments are, are a foundational way to build a different future. Uh, and you can only do that with the kind of uh, interaction and planning and thoughtful process uh, that uh, by design was not in the last uh, stimulus uh, bill. Yeah, and I think planning, planning and planners play a huge role in, in that forward thinking that, that we must have as part of these, these conversations. And planning needs to be seen as a must have, especially in times of crisis. As someone working on a planning projects around the country and the globe, uh, what do you see as the value of planning and reopening our economy and building a sustainable and equitable economic recovery? We, we know uh, that we need to rebuild in a different way. We know that uh, the very definition of resiliency is different uh, post-pandemic uh, than it was beforehand. Um, and we know that that actually building a future uh, that that is equitable, that empowers people, it involves a lot of community engagement. Uh, you don't get that without the kind of planning process on the front end uh, that, that, that brings communities together, uh, that lets people vision together, um, and that is in stark contrast to some of the infrastructure projects in the past. Um, if, if you think about uh, the interstate construction peak years, for example, um, driving interstates literally uh, through the hearts of communities and, and bisecting communities, uh, those kind of mistakes, which are generational mistakes, you're stuck with them for generations, we'll have those again if we're not more careful. And um, the, the planning part where we're thinking about how uh, the definition of resiliency is expanded to include uh, public health concerns. For example, active transportation, uh, things like walking and biking, uh, electric scooters, the kind of um, supplemental transportation elements uh, that were that are, are more and more popular. Uh, how do those fit into a larger system? And and you, do you build the social spacing in as part of that? Do you uh, make sure you electrify the future uh, as part of your response to climate change? All those things happen through a planning process. I think for as a profession. It's a it's a uniquely uh, uh, interesting and, and advantageous time uh, for the planning profession uh, because we can actually help build a better future together in a way uh, that hasn't been done in the past, knowing more than we've known in the past. Yeah, I I would totally agree with you. I, it's been really interesting during these quarantine times when I've been driving around the city of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and I've seen some of that happening, these, these, these projects, infrastructure projects that are going on right now because they have time to do them. Um, uh, one example is one of the streets down where I live, um, one of the roads, main thoroughfares, they, they removed a lane in each direction, uh, put in a dedicated bike lane, and then had parking on the other side of that bike lane. So it's a protected bike lane now as opposed to to uh, that, and it's in an uh, area that is is uh, more low income than not. So yes, equitable, uh, resilient uh, kind of thinking out, outside of the box, and we're seeing it on the ground now. But more needs to be done. So, uh, how has your perspective evolved from your varied experience overseeing the state DOT to shaping policy at a federal uh, level? and now advising, advising clients through your role in the private sector. So you've having a big impact, not only in your state, but also in, in, uh, on the federal level. Now you get to work in the trenches in the local government. So how, is, how has that evolved over time? Well, it, it's interesting. I, I, I like to think that every, uh, every bit of that experience has helped uh, in, in different ways. Uh, and you're right, we have clients worldwide today that uh, while there's less traffic volumes, are uh, taking parking lanes or general purpose lanes uh, and turning them over to active transportation. But as part of that, fundamentally rethinking what, what it actually means uh, to, to have uh, infrastructure that serves people. Um, and, and another example is uh, we have multiple uh, uh, clients we're working with that are thinking about portal to portal transit, not just the mainline transit, but how do you do the first and last mile? 
Do the transportation network companies have a positive role to play? Does micro mobility have a, a positive role to play? Um, and as we electrify the transport sector, uh, how does that uh, translate into portal to portal trips? So um, at the state level, I had a uh, real advantage uh, in Maryland DOT in that it's not just highways, it's transit, uh, it's, it's the um, uh, trail system, uh, it's aviation ports, everything. So it, it was much more of a holistic look uh, to begin with. And, and translating that to the federal level, it, it gave me a greater appreciation, frankly, for how different the needs are and how we, in different parts of the country and even within um, uh, uh, regions, how different it is. And, and the idea of being modally agnostic, of not dictating a solution, but, but actually having a community-based consensus and discussion process that, that leads you to a different place and a more sustainable one. Um, all of those have been, uh, I think, helpful uh, perspectives. I have a keen appreciation for some of the historical parts of it as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier that infrastructure investments are generational and they truly are. So you have to really think very long term about investments that are being made today. And uh, some of the uh, stimulus investments from your great grandparents, it could be the Golden Gate Bridge or the Hoover Dam, uh, we're still living with today and they're still driving the economies uh, today. So it's really important that we that we think it through from that perspective. Uh, I'd also point out that um, in the Recovery Act, at the federal level, in the Obama administration, one of the really uh, great things was through uh, the, the Tiger Grant Program, which was created as part of the Recovery Act. For the first time ever, we built a direct relationship between the federal government and local governments, where local needs actually drove federal funding rather than the other way around, where local needs weren't distorted or misshapen by available federal funding. And I think one of the great lessons going forward uh, as we think about the next phase of uh, stimulus for the country now is making sure that uh, you have that local lens and, and, and are looking at it uh, through the local lens and being responsive to local needs. At the end of the day, um, it's a national system composed of local elements that really aggregate into a national system. Yeah, and I, I, when I was living, grew up in Los Angeles and living through uh, my lifetime up until about a year and a half ago, moving to Virginia, I saw those infrastructure projects that were transformational uh, during my, my parents and my grandparents' time, the building of their, their freeway system and highway system in the Los Angeles area. It was just phenomenal. Uh, so it's, it's amazing what, what we live with for such a long period of time. So we have to keep on thinking about things in different ways and making sure that we're thinking about the future generations as well. Um, and kind of piggybacking on that whole transformational aspect, uh, in your keynote, keynote remarks, uh, you touched on several potential transformational planning issues, things like uh, infrastructure uh, electrification, uh, vertical right-of-way planning, and resiliency. Um, I'm really, really interested in that because I think that's where we're, we're headed. And if we don't start planning for it now, um, we'll be way behind. Uh, so what are your thoughts on planning's focus now and how federal policy can promote that work? Well, it, it's mutually reinforcing, first of all. I think that, that good planning can actually drive federal policy, not, not just the other way around. And if you take uh, a topic like electrification, uh, I think we all understand if 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 you if you look at the data, by far the biggest challenge of this generation is climate change, and and responding to that adequately uh, begins with taking the single largest uh, group of CO two emitters, which is the transport sector, and electrifying it as quickly as possible. Um, and that's that's not just your personal vehicle; that's the entire system. It's medium and heavy duty trucks. It's the transit systems. Um, it, it's every bit uh, of it. Uh, how do you do that in a holistic way that, that actually builds value in communities? Those uh, are really critical uh, issues. And um, from a community empowerment point of view, how do you actually do that? So uh, I mentioned electrification because our successful response to climate change certainly begins there. It doesn't end there, but it begins there. And uh, this is uh, the perfect time 
uh, to think about how uh, stimulus money would be spent in a way that actually responds to that future and builds for that future. Uh, likewise with vertical right-of-way. So we, we tend to do corridor planning in two dimensions, uh, whether it's highway or transit or a combination of it. Uh, the vertical dimension of it is uh, at least as important. If you think about the value of right-of-way um, owned uh, by government at the local level, the vertical part of it in the future will be every bit as valuable as the surface. So um, it, it may be unmanned package delivery uh, today for prescriptions uh, uh, or anything else, it is certainly going to include moving people in the very near future. And you have some really interesting work going on where cities are thinking about that vertical dimension as an extension of their planning and zoning in the vertical dimension, as opposed to, say, the Federal Aviation Administration uh, regulating airspace down to uh, ground level. And uh, that is an opportunity as well. If you're doing quarter planning today and you're not thinking about connected and autonomous vehicles uh, on the surface, uh, unmanned aerial mobility uh, in the vertical dimension, if you're not thinking about uh, using that right away for fiber, um, uh, uh, for conductive charging, then you're not really envisioning the full value of that right of way. And only through uh, a planning process where you're really thinking in the, in those generational terms, C can you pull that value out and think about it in a way that serves the ongoing and changing needs of, of the communities? That's yeah, very interesting. I mean, I uh, last year went to a, a, a many different chapter conferences and one of the keynotes at the Texas chapter conference was about unmanned autonomous flight vehicles that would be able to move you from one place to another uh, instead of getting into a car. Uh, I know that in at the Mississippi Alabama conference, we talked about infrastructure in regards to cable and, and uh, uh, making sure that they were a smart city. Uh, so I know that these things are out there. We just need to be talking about them more. And I'm glad that, that you as, as a, a thought leader is doing this. Uh, so thank you. So um, I think kind of uh, wrapping up maybe the questions, it's, it's essential for the entire planning community, industry, APA, and the profession, public and private sectors, nonprofits, to work together for influence. How can we ensure that this important connection to APA, and how can we make this happen? Well, it, uh, uh, another good question. Um, first and foremost, um, as a profession planning to be at the table as part of this discussion and you're you're leading those efforts right now uh, is absolutely critical uh the again the mistake uh from the recovery act and i was one of the guilty parties uh where we didn't uh add to the uh to the planning process we focused on the construction end of the pipeline um and uh while we got a lot of value in reviving the economy no one is saying that was transformational um, uh, so, uh, as a profession, um, planning, uh, being at the table in, as part of this discussion and working with fellow organizations, um, whether it's um, engineers or it's other uh, organizations uh, like the American Public Transportation Association, uh, the Airport Consulting uh, Council, and then some of the non-traditional actors that are out there. Uh, the International City Management Association. Uh, so the city managers seeing the value uh, in that um, NACO, AMPO, there's, there's, there's lots of organizations uh, that APA can and should, I think, partner with uh, as part of this. Um, and, uh, the, but the more general uh, point and, and the crucial point um, is that w we need to, to think about doing this in a way where the infrastructure is serving people rather than just taking existing programs uh, and just pumping money through them. We need to actually uh, together uh, think about and plan a better future uh, that is more resilient, um, that, that not just to the next pandemic, which we will have sooner or later, um, but to the, the climate realities, to the economic development realities uh, and the mobility uh, uh, challenges that we have in huge segments of our uh, communities right now. Wow, that's that's really been fascinating and and really insightful. And thank you for uh, expanding on what you did at the uh, uh, plenary on that Friday for NPC Twenty at Home. So I want to thank you for those insights, Sean, and I appreciate you taking time with us to talk.
uh, and thanks to all of you for joining this conversation. Uh, your advocacy is critically important now uh, more than ever. If you aren't already a member of the Planners Advocacy Network, I would hope that you would sign up using the My APA uh, on planning.org uh, for this free uh, to member APA resource and ensure supporting planning essential is, uh, is to recovery. Uh, if you look on that part, we have uh, uh, things that you can send to your uh, congressional leaders from your local area. Uh, and that is something that, that really does make a difference. Um, uh, I also would uh, take a, the time to have our, our uh, people that are listening to go back and look at our policy guides, uh, look at our, our knowledge base collections, uh, pay attention to the action alerts to make sure that you're able to send those things out to uh, your congressional leaders. Uh, and for more, uh, check out MPC 20 at Home collection, uh, the critical uh, COVID-19 planning resources at planning.org. Uh, this interview is the first of several APA conversations with thought leaders about planning and recovery. So stay tuned uh, to APA. And thanks again, John. Thank you, Kurt. And thanks for your leadership. Thank you.